was uh, shocked to see in the news recently about a young lady who was uh, supposedly outside an abortion clinic in a so-called exclusion zone. And the abortion clinic wasn't open, there was nobody there. All she was doing was she was, had her eyes closed and was praying. And a police officer comes along and he, he looks at this lady and he asks the lady what she was thinking and she turns around and says, I was thinking of praying. Or I was praying, she said. And the police officer promptly arrested her and told her that she couldn't do that in this place where she was in. And it made me ask the question, you know, in some aspects, how many people walk past this church and think I hate God and I hate the church? Yet there's no police officers outside the church asking people what they're thinking or arresting them for what they're thinking. Why is our world so upside down? Why is it so muddled, so confused, so challenged with its understanding of what is right and what is wrong? And we can talk about this as if it's an unknown, but the Bible clearly talks about this in a context. It gives a name to the confusion of the world, to that which is upside down, to that which is muddled, and the name is Babylon. I mean, right at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 11, you find that they're building a tower in a place called Babel. Well, if you translate Babel, it means confusion. It means mixture. It's a reminder how God came down at a crucial moment in mankind's history. And that crucial moment in mankind's history was that they were united in one common purpose, one common passion, one common pride, one common language, one common culture. I hate the church. That was against God and his principles and who he was. They built a tower because they sought to take the heavens for themselves. They sought to become gods in their own eyes. They had crucified God even in the story of Genesis. There are three things I want to talk to you about today. We're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 18. And the three things I want to talk about is victim and victor is the first. Value is the second. And the third is vindication. The book of Revelation is a very complex book. It's not a book that you read lightly. It's not a book that you just type in on Google or on YouTube, the book Revelation, because you're going to get the weird and the wonderful, because there are so many opinions as to what Revelation is all about that we too can become confused or muddled as to what the whole story is about. The book of Revelation is very full of Old Testament imagery. You need to know your Old Testament if you're reading the book of Revelation. If you don't know your Old Testament, then you're going to get more confused and more muddled. Even at the very beginning when Jesus is talking to the seven churches, note the word seven, the candles, the sticks, the imagery is pointing to the temple of God. And in the temple of God, you had a candlestick with seven arms that was shining in front of the presence of the Holy of Holies. And so when Jesus likens the seven churches, he's saying the people who are in my presence. That's what he's talking about. So the book is written to the churches. It's not about Israel in that sense. It's about the churches right at the very beginning. 
The churches are there and they're in the presence of God. Now the people of old were known and called by the name of God. And the name of God also is symbolic of the presence. So you have the people of Israel who were also the people of presence. And then you have the churches who are now in the presence of God as Jesus is speaking and talking to them. But throughout the scriptures, you have the conversation that's going backwards and forwards between the people of faith and those who are faithless. Faith, faithless. The faithful are summed up in a city called Jerusalem. The faithless are summed up in a city called Babylon. One is a bribe, the other one is a prostitute and an adulterer. It reminds us of the scriptures where Jesus talks about how he comes down and when he comes down, he will separate the peoples into two categories. What are those categories that Jesus teaches in Matthew's gospel? He teaches us of the sheep and the goats. The sheep are the ones who follow after Jesus and God, and the goats are the ones that do their own thing. They have a mind of their own. And if we have these things in context, when we read the scripture, we understand it better, don't we not? But there is also a sense that when we talk about Babylon, we're talking about specific times and specific places. We talked about the Tower of Babel. You had a specific time and a specific place when a culture, a place, a people, a city were so against God and united in how they were against him. But Babylon or Babel is not just one particular people or culture. It's many peoples and many cultures. For the Babylonians were not like the Egyptians. The Egyptians were one people, one culture. Yes, there were times when the Hisgos people came in who were Semitic. Yes, there were times when you had the Nubians who took over the south of Egypt and took it for themselves. But predominantly, Egyptians were Egyptians. They were a specific culture and a specific people. But with the Babylonians, you have an inherited culture. When it was formed, it was formed by a mighty hunter whose name was called what? Can anyone tell me his name? Nimrod. Nimrod. This powerful, strong human being who comes along and he forms two cities and Babel is one of those cities that is formed. And so we see that this culture grows up and it started almost in that area around about 5,000 BC. 5,000 BC. So seven to 6,000 or six to 7,000 years we have of human culture that is anti-God. Anti his word, anti his principles, dwelling out of his presence because they lived in the east and if you looked at the temple that was the Garden of Eden so to speak they exited out of the Garden of Eden to the east it was the same in the temple of Jerusalem to come out of God's presence you went to the east it's interesting isn't it that there are certain people groups who do pray to the east that sense of coming out of God's presence, seen in the story of Genesis, doing their own thing. But there were many cultures, many peoples who were at one time called Babylonians. You had the Sumerians and the Akkadians. You had the Amorites, uh, where you get the Hammurabi scrolls. You get the Kassites, the Chaldeans, the Persians, the Macedonians and the Seleucids. But when John is speaking to the people, 
he's talking very much of a similar culture. He's not talking of Babylon of old that we see in the Old Testament. He's talking about the Christian experience in his time under what city? Rome. And what was that culture? It was to persecute God's people. It was to subdue the nations with one language, one culture, sexual immorality, taking wealth for yourself, slave trade with masters and slaves. It's a, no coincidence under the Roman Empire, two-thirds of the people who lived in the Roman Empire were slaves, and another two-thirds or so were people who were former slaves. So the majority of people who existed in the Roman Empire were slaves at one time or another, unless you were of the elite class. You were Roman yourself. You were a Roman citizen. So when we read the story of 18, we have this in mind that Babylon is this culture that has been in the past, that passes from one people to another people, that is seen very much in Rome, but is also seen in our times today. It's a culture, it's a spirit that is anti-God. Chapter 18 of Revelation. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grow rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and the luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore in one day her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her, terrified at her torment. They will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon. In one hour your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood, articles of every kind of made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, mare and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and human beings sold as slaves. They will say the fruit you longed for is gone from you. All your luxury and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand off far off, terrified at her torment, 
they will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls, in one hour such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travelled by ships, the sailors and all who earned their living from the sea, will stand far off when they see the smoke of her burning. They will exclaim, was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and will weep and mourn, crying out, woe, woe to you great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. But rejoice over her, you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets, for God has judged her with the judgment she has imposed on you. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a millstone, large, and threw it into the sea, and said with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. The music of harpists and musicians, pipers and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. No worker of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of a bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's most important people. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of prophets and of God's holy people, of all who have been slaughtered on the earth. When you read the scripture and you listen to the words that is communicated through John, he could be talking about the world that we live in today. He's talking primarily about Rome. He's using a past story of another nation, of another people, who in the past that the people of God can see the negative things that happened to that nation. They can see it. And they're in the midst of this struggle and this persecution that's going on in this modern day era and they're saying it's impossible. How is Christianity going to survive? How are God's people going to survive in a culture that hates them, that persecutes them, that destroys them, that enjoys persecuting and destroying them? You know, you listen to comedians today and when they talk about God and they talk about his people, we are the subject of ridicule. Some people would just spit on people just as soon as they mention the fact that they're Christians or that they believe in God or that they believe in morality. Your bigots is the word that's often targeted. All these negative things and the danger we have as God's people in this environment and in this society is we can start to take on a victim mentality. God has not called us to be victims. Babylon in its mind thinks that it's the victor. I'm the queen. I shall never mourn. I shall never know suffering. You might as well be talking about the West. Globalization. The billionaires that have their yachts and their houses that are displayed on Netflix for all to see and be jealous and envious of all their luxury, all their profits that have been mined on the back of children in poor places, that have to work and slave in poverty. We're blinded to the realities of that which upholds the luxuries that we possess. 
how we get our phones, where we get our cars from, where we get our clothes from, where we get our food from. All these things that are transported from one place to another so the haves can have. And the have-nots continue not to have. There's a very big story being painted here. And you see it in Proverbs. Chapter 1 to to 9. It's very clear. There's two women in that story. One is called foolishness. And the other one is called wisdom. Foolishness is presented as a prostitute, an adulterous woman. She's faithless to her husband. And we read the story in Proverbs, it says, chapter 7, verses 18 to 27. When this woman calls out to a young man, she says, Come, let's drink deeply of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. My husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. It's the mindset of the world that we live in. There's no accountability. You know, if you're loyal to a company, it makes no difference. If you're disloyal to a company, you make more money that way. We're programmed in this society to be disloyal to the things that God requires the most. Loyalty, faith, is so important. But we live in the culture of disloyal. God is the absent landlord. You know the story of the tenants? Where he turns around and he says, I want to relate to those who are in the field of the vineyards. So I'll send the prophets. I'll send messengers. So he sends the prophets and the messengers And they kill the prophets and the messengers because they want the produce for themselves. They want the earth for themselves. They create other stories, other tales that takes the authority and the power from God who is the true landlord and gives it to humanity. There's no such thing as a God. We believe in evolution. We believe that the world just created itself. Out of nothing it was formed by itself. Yet the Bible teaches us we are fearfully and wonderfully made. My body, I look at the design of it and I think it didn't just come out of nothingness. It was not random. The earth to be so random has to be in such a location, at such a point, and such a minutiae of detail has to be placed into it. If it was just off its axis by even a small amount, there would be no life on this planet. It would not be capable of withholding life. This absent landlord, this husband that's gone away, He's gone on a long journey. He took his purse filled with money and will not be home till the full moon. With pervasive words, she led him astray. This is foolishness. Babylon. She seduced him with her smooth talk. All at once he followed her like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierces his liver like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. Now then, my sons, listen to me, pay attention, do what I say, do not let her turn your heart away from the paths. Many are the victims she has brought down, her slain are a mighty throng, her house is a highway to the grave, leading down to the chambers of death. That's the adulteress. That's the faithless way of living. That's the fool. 
But then equally at the same time in Proverbs, there is the way of peace. There is the Jerusalem. There is the one that's not confused. The righteous. The wisdom. And it says of her, Proverbs 4, 6 to 13, Do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. Cherish her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your heads and present you with a glorious crown. This is in Revelation. As the saints cast down their crowns before the Lamb of God. The Word. The one who was there at the beginning of creation. Who saw all things happen. And through all things was created. Listen, my son, and accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. Instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. There's a beautiful quotation that I was reading about victim mentality. We can sometimes have horrible things done to us. We can experience horrible things. But we too can also do horrible things to other people. Sinners are not victims. There is only one victim. That's God. Jesus was the victim, but he's also the victor. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. I want to read this quote about having a victim mentality. If you have a victim mentality, you will see your whole life through the perspective that things constantly happen to you. Victimization is thus a combination of seeing most things in life as negative beyond your control and as something you should be given sympathy for experiencing as you deserve better. At its heart, a victim mentality is actually a way to avoid taking any responsibility for yourself or your life. By believing you have no power, then you don't have to take action. We live in a world where sympathy is the meal ticket. Where the haves have faded a narrative. You need to feel sorry for yourself. It's not your fault. It's that person over there's fault. It's interesting, this happens all the time, isn't it? The us and them mentality. You find it in the Black Lives Matter movement. You find it in the sense of the Democrats when they say, you have not, you want more, you need it more. You find it in the LGBTQ community. We are the victims. We are the have-nots. And we sit there and we point the fingers at the ones who have. It's their fault, it's their responsibility, but just feel sorry for me means that you don't have to do anything. But God has not called us to not take responsibility. God has not called us to be victims, but to be victorious, not through our own strength, but through the one who died. The victim. Jesus matters more than anything else. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. None can come to the Father except through him. There's a true value. 
If you don't know Jesus in your life, your life is valueless. You do know Jesus in your life, your life is very valuable. Here is Babylon. She thinks she has value. She thinks she has worth. She's managed to subdue people so that she may get the the prize of their ill-gotten gains. But at the end of the day, there is one who will judge her. And that one who will judge her will take all that she has and give it to others who are far more deserving than she is. The first shall be last. And the last shall be first. We see, interestingly enough, three categories that are mentioned in this text where it talks about woes. The first category is the king, the Lord, the one who desires to be above others. There's the first woe. One king, one Lord, one saviour, one baptism, one father who is in heaven. I will become a father to the fatherless. It's what he says. You know, when Paul talks to Timothy and he talks about how he's to lead, he says, what do you do? Do not lord it over your fellow believers. Come to them as a brother. And those who are older in the faith, treat them as if they're your mother. This is leadership. Servant leadership. The notion that you cannot judge your Lord over your fellow humanity. Why? Because one judges and lords over you. I have no right trying to take the plank out of my brother's eye, or the speck, so to speak, when I've got the plank in my own. As Paul says, I am the chief of all sinners. But he's also the apostle of the Gentiles. The grace of knowing the true value. Woe to the king, the one who lords it over others, who's full of pride, conceit, and strength of his own might and his own actions. Those who follow the American dream will soon discover it's a nightmare. It's really happening in our society at this moment in time. The times are changing. Keep your eyes on what is happening to those who are in authority in places of governance, for God is beginning to judge the nations. He's beginning to weigh them up and they are found wanting. They are found needing. The world will not be the same. Those who invest in these governments and these nations will find their investment has no value. The second woe he talks to is the merchant. Those who make money or profit from those who have not. The wheeler dealers, so to speak, who like to swindle or take the little bit more cream off the top We can see it very much with the electric companies, the energy companies of today, who say it's all COVID's problem, it's all Brexit's problem, it's all the Ukraine and Russia's problem, it's everybody else's fault except their own greed. Their own greed. Their desire for profits. But if we blame everybody else, they won't blame us. Those who get richer and richer keep the poorer, poorer and poorer. The only thing that they're afraid of is the idea that those who are poor will wake up and smell the coffee. 
You see it very much in Russia when you had the Tsar who was at the top. I don't know whether you watched that documentary on Netflix. So alienated from the world, he made all the decisions. He was the guy on the top. He felt that they loved him. He was ordained by God to rule. And yet he was out of touch with his people, their problems, their situations. And what was the result of that? You had the, the revolution that happened. And we're still living in the result. And the aftermath in Russia has never been the same because of people's greed and self-ambition. The third woe is the sea captain. Those who, who bring people in from afar, who entertain and take on the tourist industry, but not just the tourist industry. They bring Rome or they bring Babylon to the far reaches of the earth. They're the so-called evangelists of Babylon. And then we find lockdowns start to happen. We can't fly anywhere. We can't go anywhere. We often think it's because of COVID. But God starts to restrict the movements of certain ideas and ideologies. They think that they can go far. You have the Disneys that start to entertain to the far reaches of the earth with the message of what is politically correct, what is embracing the most people of this blame culture that is anti-God, anti-God's word, anti the family, anti-male authority, anti-woman, or sex, or gender. But God starts to deal with their profit margins. All of a sudden you find that Disney is not profitable anymore. Nobody seems to be wanting to watch their message. And they're struggling for how do we cope in this society, in this environment, when all of a sudden the times change and the judgment of God starts to reach down Will it be profitable? Will it continue to succeed? What they have is valueless. The third thing, and I want to close with this, is vindication. We could talk about sexuality. It's very clear that a part of the culture of Babylon it's not just the luxury and what you have, it's the, it's the promiscuity. It's the idea that sex is a product, something you can enjoy, that you can have many partners. You can have partners of different backgrounds, different sexuality, different areas, all these different things. But the Bible is very clear that the purpose of sex can affect your spirituality. Who you sleep with can affect your spirituality. Talks about this in Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 to 20. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I t then take the member of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? God says, come out. Come out. Measure who you spend your time with. Who you unite yourself to. It influences you. For it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. You cannot be united with the spirit of God and the spirit of the world at the same time. They pull in different directions. God wants his people to be united to him. 
But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside of the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Vindicate yourself. You want to know why often the church isn't experiencing a move of God's spirit powerfully? It's because people are sleeping around. They're being promiscuous. They're giving their bodies to people that they shouldn't be giving their bodies. And in uniting in flesh, they're also uniting in spirit. God wants his people to be holy. Come out of Babylon. It's more than sex. Come out of the luxurious lifestyle, the American dream. Come back. God does not want you to experience the consequences that Babylon is going to face, the judgments that are going to come because of their attitude towards God, because of their attitude towards God's people. He wants to vindicate his people. Psalm 7, 6, 9, Arise, Lord, in your anger. Rise up against the rage of my enemies. Awake, my God, decree justice. Let the assembled peoples gather around you while you sit enthroned over them on high. Let the Lord judge the peoples. Vindicate me, Lord, according to my righteousness, according to my integrity. O Most High, bring to an end the violence of the wicked and make the righteous secure. You, the righteous God who probes minds and hearts. Romans 8, 31 to 39. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? Babylon? Will Babylon bring a charge? It is God who justifies, not the world. God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? Babylon? The world? You listen to the world, you'd think it, they were the ones who condemn. You think they were the ones that judge. You know that element of when you see people arguing on TV? You can't get a word in edgeways. There are certain people that are really annoying. You kind of just want to smack them. <laughs> Don't you? You know, you're hearing two arguments or two debates going, and this person's talking, trying to communicate their side of the argument, and somebody else is shouting over them. Blah, 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 blah. And more than half the time, it's the interviewer. It's the person who's supposed to be impartial, who's clearly not impartial. Yet God is the one who judges. God is the one who justifies. Then who is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or the sword. All these things are happening at the moment. Famine, persecution, dangers, hardships, the sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. The world sees us as weak. The world sees us as failures. There's a song written by the band called Metallica. And I used to like the band called Metallica until God spoke to me about the song that they written called The God Who Failed. 
He didn't fail. He succeeded. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Shall we stand? This is really a two-part story. We talked about Babylon today. We talked about unmasking of Babylon. But there's another person that is to be revealed. It says all creation waits. What does it wait for? Can anyone tell me that scripture? Shout it out. For the sons of God to be revealed and manifested. This is part two. We talked about the unmasking. Next part, we're going to talk about the manifestation. When the children of God come into their inheritance, when the bride is brought and presented before the Son of God in victory, without spot, without blemish. Don't we want to be in that position? It starts with us unmasking the Babylon in our hearts. Lord, we thank you for your word. Sometimes we like to choose which parts of the Bible we read. Sometimes we like to choose how we interpret your word, Lord Jesus. But the first and foremost part comes with our hearts, Lord. You probe our minds and our hearts. Search us, we pray, O Lord for signs of Babylon in our life, Lord. Whether it be luxury or lust, pride or confusion, help us to become a holy people through the power of your Holy Spirit that leads and dwells within us. Teach us how to pray. Teach us to be the people that you desire us to be, the sons and daughters of the living God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you do not condemn us, but you offer your hand out to us in love and kindness. Pray that we will take your hand and follow after you and leave all other things behind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.